The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give of us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and died, but the ones who eat this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, and said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is that spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the, the first who were those that did not believe, and who were those who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Word of God, word of life. Now here's a thought. You're a ghost, driving a meat-coated skeleton made from stardust, riding a rock hurtling through space, fear of nothing. What a profound thought that is. There's a little bit of humor to it, and definitely a lot of real irony. Perhaps we could say that this is the perfect metaphor for our daily lives. We are spirit and flesh. The spirit is willing at many times, but the flesh is definitely weak. The Holy Spirit had me reflect upon this uh, from all, all things, of course, a social media post. The next thing the Holy Spirit puts in there or plugged into these thoughts was the, was the concept of living on borrowed time. Let's really dig into that thought. What does that really mean, living on borrowed time? Who are we borrowing time from, and how do we understand time? We are fine art creatures, but God, as well as his sense of time, is infinite. Infinite, we still most likely and most naturally still see that in a box, don't we? Just like thinking of outer space. We probably see, draw the edges around that uh, outer space with a finite boundary, just like a photograph. Or probably you could say, uh, just as confused as Jesus' poor disciples this morning and this beautiful, elaborate gospel hiccup of Jesus preaching about being the bread of life. I say hiccup because we uh, heard recently Mark's version of this. It was really weird to have that old John Lennon song pop into my head right after I pondered that humorous statement or ironic statement of being a ghost, driving a meat-coated skeleton made from stardust, riding a rock, hurtling through space, also telling us to fear nothing. There's a lot of promise there, isn't there? It's almost kind of pushing the envelope into the deep end of promise. Promise is a word that we don't like too much. The old nature can't have enough faith to trust a word like that. 
I'm sure every time we hear someone say, I promise to do something, we automatically think of failure and we think of deception. We never or rarely accept the promise someone says to us. The honest planet doesn't exist, though we hope for it to. Jesus' disciples, as well as the Jews in today's gospel, were either not understanding the metaphor and taking it too literally, or just didn't want to understand it. In fact, Roman persecution waves uh, upon the early church were because of completely misunderstanding Holy Communion. They thought the early Christians were cannibals. What Jesus was trying to pound into them in today's gospel is about feeding faith, is about leading through faith. Faith is consuming. Faith is what sustains us. And the metaphor he uses of the bread of life, Jesus is what gives faith. He gives us faith. The time we are borrowing is a life well lived worthy of the gospel. We are finite creatures in one sense, and in another sense we live on as spirit. We are finite creatures, and the spirit joins the kingdom of God with the whole tapestry of life that we experience with its valleys and its mountaintops. We just have to be careful to not fall into the abyss of despair or lack of clarity and light. In hospital terms, strangely enough, the phrase living on borrowed time is uh, when science makes a breakthrough and extends the life of someone uh, who is terminally ill. And we have heard about this with when they first were experimenting with stem, stem cell research. I mean, the, that was sort of like the miraculous manna for possibly bringing about some kind of cures or slowing down uh, cancer. What was very ironic with the Holy Spirit singing that song as soon as I was reflecting upon that statement as I mentioned earlier was that the entire album of Milk and Honey was shelved and basically released after John Lennon's murder in 1980. The land of milk and honey, strangely enough as well, is a biblical history nugget. This is what the Israelites thought of their promised land and their chosen status with God. The land of milk and honey to them, complete restoration. This is what it meant, a new Eden for them. We don't think in terms of restoration anymore, really. You had to learn in terms of resurrection. You know, stretching these thoughts even further, we don't think of the transcending call from God for us to change. We justify ourselves and rule our world, more or less lacking clarity, and truly making that connection with God that's needed. The words in that song, Living on Borrowed Time, were almost like John Lennon's epiphany to, of settling down to a normal life, celebrating the fact that he found a deep foundation and essentially began to establish his new self. Let's hear ourselves in his shoes. When we were younger, we did live through moments of confusion and deep despair. When we were younger, we did live often with the illusion of freedom and power, did we not? When we were younger, we were full of ideas and felt our share of broken dreams. When we were younger, everything seemed simple, but was not so clear. We were all living on borrowed time without much thought for tomorrow. Now that we're older, we need to realize that more, the more we think we see, the less we truly know. I think that's like one of those old proverbs, right? The future is brighter, and now is the hour. He was no longer rebelling against the world without much cause, but being a rebel in the world with a greater cause, and that was finding himself. John Lennon, like many people in our current culture, struggled with being agnostic. 
I was agnostic before I found Christ truly in my life. Agnosticism simply means that one is questioning the reality and purpose of God, period. We don't think about that, or we want to avoid thinking about that, what that means to find ourselves through Christ as his disciples. Christ has become that cornerstone within each and every one of us. We are to feed upon him spiritually in order to grow and to transform the world. This is basically saying that we need to bear the cross and allow Christ to work through us by the Holy Spirit. Being motivated in our faith to accept the promises of a brighter future puts a lot of stress on us. Making today matter. We are more or less, we more or less kind of put that on the back burner of our hearts and minds for just living for today. Let's just make it through today. All the hours and everything that we have rolling in our heads that is that point of burden and stress. Reality, however, after today, there are perpetual tomorrows. What are we really doing to be effective in the world, as well as affect others with Christ Jesus' gospel? This past week, we lost a Motown icon. We lost Aretha Franklin to pancreatic cancer on August 16th. The same day of all strange coincidences, we lost Elvis Presley some 41 years earlier. I think it's wonderful that through singing gospel music inspired in worship, Aretha Franklin went on to become a creative legend. She became a creative legend in her own right and found herself there using the gift of her voice. Gospel music is quite powerful. I can say that because when I first started seminary, I was in a gospel choir. Those hymns are quite amazing and they do shake you and challenge you with your faith. Several weeks back, I don't know if you guys remember that Sunday that we uh, talked about Martin Luther King Jr. and I incorporated a variety of hymns that were spirituals. And I don't know how many people noticed, but I looked out to see your expressions. And even Don noticed some of your expressions too. And singing those words, those people's thoughts charged your heart to respond. And I, I saw it. I saw it in your faces. Being spiritually charged to respond. What creates that spiritual charge may sound obvious. It's Jesus. We don't, however, tap into him or truly partake of him enough. The floating temporal junk food of the world fills us, not only with empty promises, but a lack of motivation. And that's really an ugly place to be, to not be really motivated. It's also a very sad place to be. I thought it was interesting reading uh, some ministry coaching commentary that looked at, at how we've been losing touch with exercising our creativity, our expressiveness. They're not uh, teaching cursives in school anymore, and that doesn't mean cuss words. And they have invented intellectual coloring books now for adults to uh, get into, open up, and free their minds uh, to spiritually exercise. But what more have they been doing beyond this? Apparently not too much. Early in September, the Clark County Ministerial Association that I've been doing some volunteering for will be having a formation retreat to whether or not they should keep this group going for pastors to keep it open. The center will be having this meeting at, uh, has a Christian labyrinth in the backyard. You don't see those too often. There are very few places that have them. And probably some of you, uh, going back in memory there, when you think of mazes, you see the, the one that was in the movies, The Shining. <laughs> now, uh, that might come uh, to mind at first. But a, a Christian labyrinth is supposed to open up your spirit while you walk. <laughs> I know we have to create something more practical for our backyard here to have youth events and weddings and so forth, 
But I'm hoping that we do not rule out doing more spiritual activities together. I'm hoping as well that this will be beyond what we do when we gather here Sunday mornings. A couple of years back, I loved when I was allowed to lead the, the once a month Saturday renewal services at St. Philip's Church. We would do centering prayer and Lectio Divina and sang Taze songs. We would pray upon one another and we would make our, our own little labyrinth, make our own little path of well, walking into the backyard area behind that sanctuary building. And it was a beautiful little tiny alcove or, uh, of trees and things and plants uh, just underneath the metro tracks. Probably not too spiritual when the metro train kind of buzzed by. <laughs> Some renewal services would include a rubric I invented, which would be to, uh, to write a personal prayer to God on a little piece of paper and burn it, and then use the ashes to anoint the people to reflect. It would be also there in that backyard garden sanctuary that we would host a sunrise Easter morning service. This would be somewhat at the crack of dawn, uh, 8 a.m. <laughs> it's the little things that make today matter for tomorrow. It's the little things that we could do each day that jar our spirit, jar our spirit and help us to realize our faith. Our faith is one that is fed by Christ. The resurrection alone is proof of the indestructibility of the claims of Christ. The claims and strength of Christ, his gospel, is living into that spirit. That spirit that, yes, is in temporal flesh, riding on a floating rock in space, hurling to who knows where. And it is while well fearing nothing. Fear, mistrust, anxiety, all the garbage of the world is what weighs upon us, weighs down upon us, and makes things seem futile. People who are depressed, people who are fighting to keep their bearings, are lost in this wilderness. It is a wilderness of not, not trusting in the promise, not having enough faith to be motivated to respond. All God ever seeks of us is to respond in grace, as we are his children. We may not be in the land of milk and honey, but as the biting statement of New York Governor and Andrew Cuomo hits home, he says that America was never that great. But living on borrowed time means that we must fight to make things change. We must fight to make not only today matter, but tomorrow as well. We must build that foundation. We must build within ourselves with Christ at the center. We must see that light even when the darkness seems to be overpowering to move forward. And speaking of fearing nothing and moving forward at the end of our gospel this morning, just when Jesus is really pointing out their lack of faith, Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He finishes his thought by saying, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the beginning of Peter's journey here. This is uh, his new journey that, of course, we'd hear much more about in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, Peter almost becomes that Marvel superhero uh, alongside the efforts of St. Paul. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That verse is beautifully sung in some traditions before the gospel is read. Having written and researched a paper for the entire, this entire past summer on worship, I think it's wonderful that this is sung as the ultimate statement of believing and being fed by God's word. Lord, to whom shall we go? Do we say this enough in our daily prayers? Lord, where do you need me to go? What do you need me to do? Do we trust his promise enough to feel that we can realize the kingdom of God here and now? Or do we just lack that good amount, enough faith? 
So you are a ghost, driving a meat-coated skeleton made from stardust, riding a rock hurtling through space. What are you really fearing? How are you going to live with this borrowed time? That is a gift from God in the here and now. Jesus Christ is the true bread from heaven. His word is our meal. Are you on a diet? It's in your hands, people. This space is not only a place we gather in, but we're supposed to be doing things beyond it. Making today matter by being fulfilled, building upon that foundation, create, it, create tomorrow by transcending it. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, help us to serve you. Help us to serve our neighbors by being filled with the Spirit, making a song in our hearts, being accountable to one another because of the word of Christ. Make our days on this floating rock in space matter. Make our lives matter during this borrowed time. Let us partake in the bread of life that you are for the world. Amen.